to be here once again with you all. I'd like um, if you guys would amuse me just briefly, turn back to Psalm 23 this evening. We're not going to... Well, I didn't. Well, I didn't get to finish. <laughs> I thought about um, taking this evening's service and you know finishing preaching the rest of my sermon. And I thought, well, I already told him we'd do the family tonight, so I want to get back on track to that. But I wanted to at least point out something. This is kind of where I was going to lead and conclude with the the sermon this morning, um, but ran out of time. Can't believe it. So. If you follow through this this passage, I just want to point out something interesting where the the scripture takes a bit of a turn right at the end. Because the whole psalm up until verse number six is about the Lord being our shepherd and he's leading us. Right. But then you get to um, the end and it's talking about the things that will follow me. So I just wanted to point out that if you follow Christ, good things will follow you. Amen. So let's go ahead and turn then in our Bibles. I'm going to have you all turn. Let me see, because I'm going to do a little bit of introduction just to get us back up to speed. Um, well, let's just let's just hold tight for a minute. Let me let me recap what we're talking about. We're going through the families. We've talked about um, three of the letters. We're using families as an acrostic. So we talked about the fellowship of individuals. We talked about the alignment of those uh, contributors. And then we talked about models of duty. And so we're on our third sub-lesson of that topic, basically just talking about God's design of male and female. And while it seems that some of those things should be fairly obvious from uh, the creation that God had made, he put them in his word for a reason. Uh, It's kind of like the verse, you know, it is... um, that we didn't make our, what does the verse go? It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. When I was a kid, I always thought, that's a weird verse to need to put in the scripture. But it turns out we need that one. Um, and by the way, I think that, that that scripture applies to the new birth as well as our physical birth. Uh, we didn't make ourselves, right? Amen. And so, and nonetheless, a lot of these things seem basic and fundamental, but they're in God's word for a reason. And we see by looking at the world around us what happens when God's word goes ignored. Uh, And so we have kind of uh, chaos and pandemonium and strife and contention and division all in the name of love. So it's a great thing. Um, But we're talking about love in a scriptural context. And we're talking about male and female. We're told in Mark that God from the beginning made them male and female. So we've talked a little bit about how male and female is um, it's not necessarily an aspect of godliness per se. Male and female are specific functions. The Bible says God hath given everything a body as it hath pleased him. So the fact that you are a soul with a body, right? Godliness emanates from the soul of man, right? So if we're going to pursue godliness, that's a matter of the soul. What's going on within the soul of man being regenerated by the spirit of God and being quickened, made alive unto the things of God and having that right spirit within us, that new man. Um, But the body is given to us. And it gives us direction to know how to live out our godliness. If you were created a female, then that's a specific role that brings certain responsibilities. If you were created male, likewise. And so each of us are commanded by the God who made us to find our way in this world using the design that he gave. For it, he gave us um, bodies that are either male or female. And then he put us in a creation with a pattern and some framework that, that tells us what the respective responsibilities of males and females are. So we've been going through a little bit of that. We've been talking about the work of uh, the adversary. We know that men are created to be husbands. That's the fundamental principle. Not every man will necessarily ultimately be married and be a husband, but the created pattern is that men are created to be husbands, women are created to be wives, and then they are called after that to either be mothers or fathers. We talked about the work of the adversary in leading both men and women away from their God-given place, that uh, silly women are led away with diverse lusts, away from the home, away from their children, away from their husbands, away from those responsibilities. And then in Proverbs talked about that a man who wandereth from his place is as a bird that is uh, that is wanders from her nest or is chased even uh, is the, the context of that. 
So it's not a good thing when we leave those, leave those God-given places. We talked a little bit about the responsibilities that are incumbent upon us as either men or women, right? We start out with boys and girls, and they are male and female. Uh, but the objective of training up boys and girls who are male and female is to develop men and women. We talked this morning a little bit about how we live in a world of juveniles to a great extent. We need more men and women, right? We need, we need people who are mature, people who are seasoned, people who are experienced, people who are tempered by the battle and by the fight and know how to stand fast and to be strong in the faith. Uh, so we need some men and women in the work of God. And the goal, if we're uh, young people, is that by the age of 20, that you should be prepared for battle. Right? God's design is that those 20 and years old and upward should be prepared to do battle. And so we're trying to raise young men and women. So God has given males the responsibility for providing for their households, for their wives, and if he gives them for their children, they're called to work. Uh, they are commanded to love their wives. We talked about how the wife is not commanded in Scripture in the sense that we look at the marriage relationship. The wife is not given the command to love her husband. She's, uh, we see that the older women teach the younger women how to love their husbands. So there's, uh, there's at least this idea that there was truly the command from Christ to love one another. I'm not diminishing that at all. But in the marriage context, the idea is that the man holds the primary responsibility for loving the wife. And then the wife learns to love her husband. Uh, and so we're, we spent some time talking about that. So men have these responsibilities as well as to give honor to their wife, to render due benevolence to their wife, and all those kind of things. Women likewise have some responsibilities that are given to them, uh, that they are to submit themselves to their own husbands, right? By God's grace, you only have to listen to one other man most of the time. Uh, and that's your own husband or your father in lieu of a husband if you have not yet been given in marriage, right? So that is God's direction for women in their lives is that they be under the authority of a man who can look out for their welfare, who can protect them, who can care for them, provide for them. Uh, and typically in Scripture, we see that that is the case, that women are provided for, they are cared for because they are a picture of the church, Right? And so we have that um, picture given in the marriage between the husband and the wife, the husband being Christ, the wife being the church. Um, but she is not without responsibility, right? She is called to reverence her husband. She is commanded um, or at least given the responsibility for bearing children. Who is she bearing them for? The husband, right? They're the husband's children and she bears them on his behalf carries them for nine months, and then brings them into this world through birth for him. That's the, that's the context of the relationship. Remember, in families, in scriptural terms, we've lost this in society today, but in scriptural terms, families are delineated by the father, right? So one father in scripture, we even see, might have had multiple wives. Either one died and he married another one, or he had several at the same time. All kinds of different uh, messy pictures of families, but they're always delineated by the father. So the, the seed that issues forth from the father, that's the family, right? So you might have um, other things going on in your family, and families certainly today are a mess, but scripturally speaking, fathers bear that responsibility. Um, I don't know how that works with all the... Uh, donor programs and everything else that all the scientific marvels of today where one guy can have like 600 kids um, I don't know if the Lord still counts him responsible for all 600 of those or not but we've certainly made a mess of things um, so I don't think that the more and more we play around with trying to be God with science and all those kind of things I don't know that it's served us well in, uh, in the social arena of life um, so nonetheless we'll continue uh, women are to bear children. They are to guide the house. We talked about that word guide, and I'm just getting you up to speed here. That guide, uh, guide the house basically is one word in the Greek that means to be the ruler of the home, the ruler of the house. And so that the charge, we talked about that shared dominion. How many of you remember the lesson on shared dominion? That there is a respect in which women are to rule in the home, and then the, 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 the mother is kind of down and in, if you will, in the setting of the home, and the father is kind of up and out. So that the father, uh, the dominion of the father and the concerns of the father are up and out into the world and into the community. And the wife is ruling down and in. Not that the father doesn't have 
uh, vested interest in those things. But generally speaking, that's kind of the breakdown that we give. And that's what Paul is saying, that women ought to bear children, guide the house, to be keepers at home. Um, it's not necessarily the same thing as being kept at home. Right? It's not, Paul's not forbidding them to leave the house. He's just saying that their dominion, their interests, their, the lines of demarcation for their responsibility of what they're charged with keeping is that they're supposed to keep the house. And that's a big responsibility that falls to the women. And certainly the men are responsible for creating an environment, providing the tools and resources that the women need. Uh, guys, your wife ought to be able to tell you what they need. Uh, I don't know about some of you men. I've, I've been in construction a lot of my working career. And one of the most frustrating things is not having the tools I need um, because it's, it's all about having the tools, right? You have the right job. I love to play the piano. I hate to play a bad piano. Um, you know, I love to build and construct things, but I hate not having the right things. So guys, our, our wives are looking to us to provide them with the tools and the resources and the things that your wife ought to be able to say, hey, I need X, Y, and Z. And that ought to be more important to us than the things we want. What our wife needs is should take precedence over the things we want, right? So if she needs a new set of dish towels or if she needs a new set of pots and pans or she needs a new set of knives or she needs uh, tableware or she needs certain ingredients from the store and whatever, all the things that she requires to run the home, who is she supposed to go to with those needs? She's supposed to go to her husband. Say, hey, I need these things and so they... The husband could be made aware, and then it's his job to say, okay, well, I guess I will pass on the, you know, the new Nintendo Switch or Sony PlayStation that I was saving up for or whatever, and just say, hey, what, what, what my wife needs takes precedent over what I want. And so I'm going to forego that fishing trip with the buddies or the whatever, and I'm going to make sure that I'm ministering to the wife and providing for her needs. Uh, and we ought to have a vested interest, men, in wanting to do that. Amen. So we talked about some of that as well. Um, then we talked about um, that they are to render due benevolence to the husband, right? Just like the, the husband is to the wife, the wife to the husband. Can I, can I say this? Be kind, right? I think we've heard that this year already. Be kind. Brother Gibson brought that out. He did a lot of teaching on marriage the week he was here. We've probably forgotten most of that, right? Amen. Uh, but if you remember some of those things, one of the things he really emphasized was being kind. Uh, there ought to be no place more kind that you can enter than your own home with your own family. You ought to know that you have a sanctuary, a place of refuge, a place of retreat from this world that wants to beat you down and discourage you and everything else. You ought to step into your home and know that this is a sanctuary. This is a, a special place where we can retreat from the world and we can be cared for in a proper way. Um, so moving on from there, today we're going to be talking a little bit about just the roles beyond the home because um, while this isn't necessarily We'll start, we'll start within the home, but we're going to talk application a little bit beyond the home because the idea of male and female, while it is the, the foundation of the family itself, that's where family begins, right? A man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And what God hath joined together, let not man put us in. You do not have the authority from God's point of view. You do not have the authority to disannul what he has done. And when he joins a couple together, he says, you don't have the authority to undo what I've done. Uh, and so in the eyes of God, we may have writs of divorcement and, and we can go through legal processes to satisfy the civil nature of what's involved in a marriage as far as human government. But you just need to know when you sign those documents in the eyes of God, that does not disannul a marriage. That may satisfy the legal duties you have to the society in which you live, but in the eyes of God, you're, if you go marry someone else and have relations with someone else, you're an adulterer because your spouse is still living that you were initially covenanted to in the sight of God. So those things ought to be entered into uh, very circumspectly. But I want to talk a little bit about the roles of male and female, not just in the home, right? We read, read in Timothy and Titus about some of the responsibilities in the home, and we've covered those. But I want to talk a little bit more broadly about that. So we're going to talk um, about the church just a little bit. So I want to I want to go to just go ahead and dive right in. I, I typically am prone to avoid controversial things and controversial passages of Scripture. <laughs> just kidding. Not really. Um, there shouldn't be controversial passages of Scripture. 
among the children of God, okay? So let's just get that out of the way real quick. It, the Word of God just is. Uh, we don't ever judge it. It always judges us. And we just humble ourselves, and we say guilty is charged, amen, and we plead the blood of Christ uh, and ask for his mercy and forgiveness and, and move humbly on through this life. Uh, we don't try to judge God's word and, and say that the Lord was out of line when he instituted something. So our job is simply to receive the truth of God and submit to it. And some of those things that are deemed controversial, they are contrary to our nature. But they're not controversial. And so 1 Timothy chapter number 2 uh, let's look at some of these where the roles of men and women uh, also concern church life, okay? So there is a, there's a role for men in the church, and there is a role for women in the church. Amen. Amen. In this life, the, the bodies we have been given play a part in helping us find our place in the, in the framework that God has instituted. Now, in the world to come, we don't, we don't know exactly what, but we do know that in Christ, there is neither male nor female, and that in the world to come, they're not going to marry or be given in marriage. But Christ says they shall be as the angels. They're the sons of God, and it's interesting, we're called sons of God. Even the females are called sons of God. Why? Because they're, they're sharing in the inheritance, and inheritance is always, uh, speaking in scriptural terms, it's almost always, uh, but in the law, especially delineated, that it's given to the sons. And we're all sons of God, even the females, right? And so because we're all joint heirs with Christ. So in the world to come, it's a, it's a different dynamic, and I don't have the kind of answers that you want. You know, I know you want to ask all the weird questions about what does that mean for our bodies and everything else. I don't have answers to those questions. All I know is what the Scripture reveals, which is uh, that we will be as the angels, we will have a resurrected, glorified body, and we will uh, be grateful to be there. Amen. But in the church, now in this age, in this world, and in this time, uh, male and female do have a role in the church. And so we're going to look just a little bit at that briefly. Verses number 11 of chapter number 2. Let the woman learn in what? Silence. Silence. Now, Men are supposed to learn too. But men, we're not, we're not dismissed from the responsibility of learning. But it's within the function of the church as we are gathered together and assembled in the name of the Lord, there is an orderliness to what Paul teaches the churches. This is what it needs to look like. As was mentioned in Sunday school, Paul is the authoritative messenger of Christ. So this is not just Paul thinking, I think this would be good. This is Paul telling us what the Lord told him to institute. And so he says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man. And, and those are two different things. Right? When he's talking about teaching, and we'll see some context in other places, he's not saying that women should never teach. There are settings in which he says women should teach. He's talking about in the assembly. Right? And he's talking about that kind of authority that is given to the men. So there is a, a certain kind of authoritative teaching that is specifically applied to the office of bishops and deacons, but even more generally just to the men of the church. This might surprise you, but in uh, the New Testament church, it was, it was a little bit different, I think, than what we have today. While there were pastors who were responsible for overseeing the work, and they certainly there were those who were the principal teachers but the men of the church shared in the teaching responsibility. Paul says that if there would be uh, someone who's teaching, and it's, in other words, if I might be, I might be have my Bible open to 1 Timothy chapter number 2. And, and let's say, for example, I'm teaching out of this chapter, and as I'm teaching, the Lord reveals something to Brother Jim. It's not out of order for Brother Jim to raise his hand and get and get the primary speaker's attention and want to make a contribution. Paul, Paul says if something's revealed to him and he feels that the Lord's given him something to share, let the first person hold his peace, right? There's an orderliness. Let the first hold his peace. And then I would acknowledge Brother Jim. And then Brother Jim could say, well, you know, I was reading over here in Titus the other day and I read this and it's interesting how these correspond. He could share that with the congregation. 
Paul said part of the reason for that type of engagement is he says this. He says that all may learn. See, if one person's doing all the teaching, they're not getting the opportunity to learn. One of the things I love about having the men uh, share the teaching on Wednesday is it gives me a chance to learn. Right. Because I know that the Lord will reveal things to other men that I've not seen in the word of God. That's how it should be. So Paul says that all may learn. It gives everyone a chance to learn because not one person's having to carry all the water on all the teaching. And so everyone may learn. But in the process, he says, of that kind of a teaching engagement where one person may, you know, con contribute something and somebody else may contribute. And we're doing it in a very orderly way. And by the way, it's not um, just to be clear, it's not Jim standing up and say, well, I think this. It's Jim standing up and saying, well, I've seen in the word of God where he says this. Right, so teaching should be more about what God says than what we think. But in that process of shared teaching responsibilities, what Paul is saying that women are prohibited from participating in that environment. That they're not, they're not given the place that they're supposed to learn in silence. Right? Men can learn and share the teaching responsibility. Right? We, can, we can take turns as men doing that, but women aren't supposed to do that. And you might ask the question, well, well, why are women not allowed to do that? Uh, notice what Paul says. He appeals to the created order of things, right? It doesn't have anything to do with women's ability. Because some people say, well, women are just as able. Well, undoubtedly, probably more able. It wouldn't be a temptation to allow them to teach if they were completely incompetent. The reason it's a temptation to allow women to do those things is because they can do it quite well. That's why it's a temptation. There are kind of very gifted women. But that doesn't mean it honors the Lord when it takes place. Right? But it is a temptation because they can be very effective. You say, well, they're, they're very, they're very, they really move me. And they really, okay, great. It moves the Lord too, but it makes him angry. So we need to just understand when he's laying these things down, it's not about, well, whether they're, not, they're capable or they're able. They're, they're just as smart, just as capable. It's, those are not, those are qualifications don't enter the picture. What enters the picture is, are you willing to acknowledge God's order and design of things? Right. Because when he made you a woman, he knew that he had said, Women need to learn in silence in the church. Does that make sense? The same God that gave you the body you have is the same God that said how he wants things done in the church. So Paul goes on to say, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man. Right. So we do not have women in teaching positions over men. Who is a man? It's someone 20 years old and up. Scripturally speaking, that's a man, not a boy. Right? I'm talking about men. They're not to have authority over men. Do women have authority over boys? All the time. Is that appropriate? Absolutely. Right? I don't, I don't have any boys of my own, but if I did, and I feel the same about my daughters, if I had boys and one of the women of the church observed one of the boys, you know, about to do a, a, a backflip off the top of the hand sanitizer station... I would want that woman to teach him a thing yep. if I'm not around, right? That a godly woman would take the time to instruct the young man. You know, women have these big rings. My own mom had one. <laughs> and it managed to find that soft spot right on the back of my head. Just give him one of those, right? And say, no, get down off of there, right? So there, certainly teaching is not the issue. It's authority over men, right? That authoritative teaching position over other men that's where things get out of order. That's where we violated the order that God instituted. And that's what Paul appeals to. He says, for Adam was first formed and then Eve. In other words, Adam was created. God gave Adam the instructions for the human race. And then he formed Eve and brought Eve to Adam. So who was Eve's instructor? It was Adam. Who's Adam's instructor? It's the Lord. Right. So Christ is the maker of Adam and he instructs Adam. And then Eve is formed from Adam and Adam is responsible for teaching Eve. 
And so this created order that the world just hates. And if you hate it, it's because you're of the world. The world hates this because God chooses it. And it leaves us feeling very creaturely and not godlike at all. Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity, holiness and sobriety. Uh, and that is not the eternal salvific salvation that he's talking about. But we don't have time to get into all of that. So we have in the church that there is constituted by Christ and an order of things that is appropriate. And so we have to understand as the people of God, it's our responsibility to do that. Turn over to 1 Corinthians real quick and we'll, we'll see another one and then we'll move on. But these, these correspond to each other in a particular way. And I think it's worth taking the time to visit. 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. In verse number 29, um, and by the way, women aren't the only ones who are told to keep silent in the church. Who else was told to keep silent in the church? People who speak in a tongue that we can't understand them. Right? He's just got done covering that in 1 Corinthians 14 as well. If you're speaking in a language we don't know and there's no one to interpret, you're supposed to hold your silence in the church as well. It's interesting that you're still supposed to be there. You're still supposed to be there, but you need to learn in silence uh, because you're not helping anyone else. And so we're here supposed to edify one another. So he says, let him speak to himself and to God, right? And then he goes on and says, let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So he's going on talking about how the teaching is supposed to be conducted in the church assembly. All right, so this is in the assembly. This isn't, you know, it's sun, this isn't small group or, you know, this isn't after services, a few women talking in the corner. This is in the assembly, the things that take place when we're gathered together in the spirit of the Lord. He says in the context of this teaching, he's talking about how the teaching is supposed to be done. And in that context, he says, let your women keep silence in the churches. Now, does that mean that women cannot say amen? No. no. All the people said what? Amen. amen. All God's people said amen. It's not a matter of being silent as a church mouse. It's not the idea that you have to sit there and you can't make any noise, right? Women can't sing. Women can't do anything. It's not, it's not what he's trying. It's in the context of this teaching that's supposed to be taking place in the assembly. He's saying how the teaching should be done. And he says, Let the women keep silence, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let the master husbands at home. Right? So if the men will learn anything, is it appropriate for a man to raise his hand and get the attention of the speaker and ask a question in the assembly. Absolutely. I don't, there's not a problem with that, right? He says, the women, if they want to learn something, what should the women do? They need to ask their husbands at home. Men, you better get in your Bibles. Because if you have a godly wife, she may have some questions. You need to have an answer. Or you need to be willing to go to your pastor and say, hey, I need an answer to this, and I'm not sure what it is. And we can pray about it together and seek the Lord about it together. But in the assembly, it's perfectly appropriate for a man who is unclear on something or has a question to raise his hand and say, help me understand that, right? Not to be difficult or ugly or spiteful or to, you know, play got the preacher, but if you sincerely have a question, that, there's nothing wrong with that. I would, I would welcome that. If anybody wants to raise their hand and say, hey, help me understand that because you covered that really quickly. I didn't get it. Um, now, on Sunday morning, that's less likely to happen because everybody's like Ooh, lunchtime and everything. <laughs> Wednesday evening, maybe Sunday night. That'd be probably a good time. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with that taking place. But for a woman to speak out in the assembly like that is out of order. And you say, well, that's weird. It's just because of the bodies we have. Yeah, it's just because the bodies we have. 
say, well, I thought this is just what it, what's in the heart that matters, right? It's just what's the Lord knows my heart. So what does it matter if I'm a man or a woman, right? Well, he knows that if in your heart you want to honor him or not. And he gives those commands to try your heart and to see, do you want to honor me and listen to my ways or not? Or do you want to be obstinate and rebellious? Uh, the overwhelming majority of even professing Christians today choose to be rebellious. They choose to be rebellious in these, in these matters. And I, I can't understand that. It doesn't make any sense. Why cling to a religion that you don't believe or practice? All I know is that they are wolves in sheep's clothing. That they are sent into the assembly to create division and strife by the adversary of Christ. Right? Now, can, does Christ use that? Absolutely. He's sovereign over everything. Right? So the devil's not getting anything over on anybody. The Lord uses all of that to refine his people and... Some of those people are sheep yet to be one to the Lord, right? So the Lord, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not murmuring and complaining that that's the way it is. I'm just making you aware that that's the way it is. And so we have to be wise to that. So these commandments are given by Christ to try our hearts to see, do we love Christ? Or do we have another Jesus? Or we've made up our own Christ in our own mind that doesn't see things quite the way that the Lord Jesus Christ parses them in his word so we have these roles of men and women given in the church we know that they are given for our welfare right they're for our good they may not they say well it kind of hurts my pride uh, you know if you're a woman you want to be a pastor right it kind of hurts hurts my feelings that i don't get to be a pastor i feel like i've been excluded or whatever i don't know what you would i don't know what you would maybe feel like um but I can imagine that if that was something you thought you wanted to do, and the you know who likes to be told you can't do something you want to do. Nobody likes that. Little kids don't like that. They just want to do what they want to do. And you think if someone likes you, they're just going to tell you that if you want to do that, you should do that. Go ahead. But somebody who loves you won't do that. Somebody who likes you might, but somebody who loves you won't do that. We have to understand that the commandments of Christ are given in love. So there are roles. For men and women, this isn't about women uh, just, you know, being so somber that they never make a noise in church. This is about authority. This is about teaching. Uh, this is about attempting to, to exercise authority over men, uh, reprimanding their pastor in public. Uh, that kind of stuff goes on. It ought not go on. It's out of order. Right? It's dishonoring to the Lord Jesus Christ. Is your pastor worthy of being rebuked? undoubtedly but is that the way it should be done no you ever you ever find that in your attempt to correct someone else's wrong that you violated what was right yeah. that happens a lot right so we have to be careful about those things as well so there are roles in church life uh, and even even as it relates to the believer and the unbeliever right in these unions of marriage Paul deals with that in the church as well so male and female has a place not only in the home, but also in the church. We need, uh, we need strong men and women in our churches. Amen. We need women who will embrace with their, their whole soul what God has called them to be as a woman. We don't need women trying to be men. And we certainly don't need men trying to be women. Amen. I got a lot more amens to the second part of that. Amen. We don't need either, folks. Amen. We don't need women trying to be men. Amen. Okay. See, it's still really weak, isn't it? We got women who just want to be men, I guess. I don't know. It's weird. But when I say we don't need men trying to be women, Amen. everybody's all excited about that one. That is bizarre. Culture feels the same way. Culture feels the same way. But the reason we have men trying to be women is because we've let women be men. So you need to feel as strongly about women trying to be men as you would about a man trying to be a woman. There is something just really bizarre about a man who wants to be a woman. Yeah. <laughs> but it ought to be just as bizarre Amen. to our minds and way of thinking when women try to act like men. 
I was talking to a pastor at the uh, the conference over the weekend. And he was talking about how when he deals with couples, he always learns a lot. He said, you know, because he has um, he he was talking a lot about trying to create a strong male leadership culture in your church. And he said, if if he's dealing with a couple and the woman's doing all the talking, he's learning a lot. But he said he's he said he will always try to turn back to the man and and bring him into the conversation. And then if they're still not getting it, he said he'll finally just ask point blank, why is she doing all the talking? Yeah. And it's a fair question. Remember, the wife is down and in. The husband's up and out. Right? So that understanding of those roles that when the family's engaging up and out, who needs to be leading? The wife? No, the husband, right? When your kids want to go have sleepovers at their friends' houses, who's, who's responsible for leading in that area of the home? The wife? No, that's up and out. That's family to family. And the father needs to be leading every step of the way in making those decisions for the family, right? This is how our family plugs into another family, and it's up and out leadership, Right. Down and in is child to child within the home, right? And dealing and managing with rearing up that next generation. And part of that is they need to see those role models played out in a responsible way so that they can understand what it means to be a mom and what it means to be a dad. Um, so in the church, there are those responsibilities. What about in society? What do you do when you live in a society that has utter disregard for the framework God instituted? Uh, because it seems to be, you know, the, the rule of the day to kind of, if you can't beat them, join them kind of thing, right? So what do you do? And this, and this thing gets a little muddy because in civil affairs, uh, it is a little different. You know, inevitably, almost every time I talk about women not having a authority, pos positions of authority over men in church or teaching in a position of authority over men in church, who do you think is the first person in the Bible that everybody points to? Not Ruth, Deborah. close, Deborah. Inevitably, every single person I talk to, well, you know, old Deborah, Pastor Deborah, she's, uh, she's one of the iconic heroes of the faith for women, as she well should be. But she was not a pastor. That's right. And am I always quick to ask this question? Point me to a scripture that Deborah ignored and violated to fulfill those responsibilities. There isn't one. There is a difference between Deborah and women pastors of our day. Not the least of which is that to be a woman pastor in our day, you must explicitly ignore Christ's command to not do that thing. Deborah never did that. There was no scripture given that says, you know, that a woman cannot be a mother to Israel in this way. Didn't, there was no such scripture. But there's plenty of scripture about how the New Testament church ought to operate. We won't get off into all that. But in society, it's difficult, right? Because how many of you work in a corporate setting where you have to deal with, um, you know, a mix of male and female leadership and everything else? Right. So I think about men like Joseph. I think about men like Daniel. You will not escape. Right. And our and our calling is not to be hermits and just go, you know, like the Amish and just kind of go build a little satellite community off the grid and rear our children and build big stone walls around our property and never have any interactions. Is that is that anywhere in Scripture that Christ wants us to do that? No, you're going to be. You're going to be in this world. It's going to be messy. It's going to be not going to be the way that the Bible says things ought to be everywhere. So when you're in that setting, what are the things, one of the things you need to realize is that it's because we know the truth that we can be a light in the darkness. Now that doesn't mean being obnoxious. There's a difference between just making yourself a thorn in everyone's side because you act like you know what's right and being a light for the truth. And some of the things that the Lord has given us to be a light for the truth um, are helpful for us to contemplate. I'm going to go to everyone's least favorite verse in the Bible. It's in Deuteronomy 
chapter number 22. Everybody already knows what it is. It's one of the most maligned passages of Scripture as well. Because people like to, to uh, mockingly refute it uh, by citing other examples of the law that no longer hold sway in the mind of God or of the saints. And so they try to throw it in the pile. Um, you know, like, for example, if you take verse number 9, Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with diverse seeds, lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown and of the fruit of thy vineyard be defiled. Uh, thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. Right? Some of these things that God is giving in the law for his people, one, the Apostle Paul tells us that these are actually given to give us pictures of spiritual truths. For example, when, when the Lord commands his people, don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. Paul asks the question, is God really concerned about the oxen to the extent that he's commanding in his law, don't muzzle the ox? Or is he teaching us something in a picture of about if you have someone who's performing a work and a service, don't deprive them of partaking in their labor, the fruit of that labor. And so he makes application of that to the, <laughs> interestingly enough, I think he's making application of that to making sure that you are giving to those who are ministering to you of the things of the Lord Jesus Christ from the word of God. So I'm, I'm the ox that's treading out your corn, right? This is, this is the picture. This is how it worked in Old Testament Israel. This is a bit of a departure from our topic. Do you, do you mind? So the everyday average Joe didn't have time to study the word of God all day. That was the priest's job. So the priest is mulling over the things of God and he's studying it and he's trying to do it. So he can have a deep enough understanding of it so that when the people come to the temple three times a year, he can very simply, clearly, and concisely give it to them in a form that can be digested. What's the ox doing as he's treading out the corn for you? He's taking all the truths and the doctrines and the things of God and studying them out and then breaking it all down, it's kind of like a mother preparing a meal for her family. Take all the raw ingredients and break it down and put it into a form where people can receive it. Right? So the, the ox is doing the work of treading out the corn. And so Paul says, hey, you don't, if you shouldn't muzzle the ox, then you ought to at least allow the minister of the word of God to be receive of your carnal things since he's sowing to you spiritual things. So all of these things are given. They all have spiritual application. Right? Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. Does that mean it's a sin for you and I today to go out here and to find an ox and a donkey and hitch them up and start plowing field? Are we breaking the law of God? Are we we're guilty of sin and everything else? Well, it was given to them as a commandment. But some people try to take that and say, oh, see how ridiculous this all is. And then when you get down uh, to verse number five, they try to throw that into that same pile and say that, oh, this is just as silly. And they make a mockery of it. But let's just read verse number five just to see if we can understand the spiritual truth that Paul is giving. He says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Okay, is that what your Bible says? Yes. Now I want you to muse on that as if you're a Bible commentator. And what do you think it means? Yeah, it means women shouldn't wear man's clothes. That's way too simple. It says, a woman shouldn't wear that which pertains unto a man. Neither shall a man do what? Well, that's just absurd. What man in his right mind would put on a woman's... I mean, you see some guy coming into church with silk stockings. He's going to get punched right in the nose. Right, Gary? I mean, you're not going to stand for that for one minute. It's ridiculous. But it ought to be... But it ought to be just as ridiculous for a woman to put on man's clothes. Right. But it's not, is it? Because the culture has tempered our thinking. You know, when it first started happening, it stood out like that. Yeah. Gary was telling me he went home today and looked at his... Was it, I don't know if you went home today and looked at it, but you were telling me in your yearbook that you go back and look at the yearbook when he graduated in what year? 68. That all the girls in his whole yearbook are wearing dresses. 
Every one of them. They didn't allow pants. Ah, those sticklers for rules, you know. It's just. But if you go down to City Hall and you look at the pictures on City Hall wall down there, you know what you see? That all up through the 70s and early 80s, all the women are wearing dresses. And then you get into the 90s, more pants on the women, and then shorter hair and more pants. And then the modern day, it's all the women wearing pants. They all have bobbed off hair, whatever. So these these guardrails are given remember what was what was the interest of god in giving his people these it was to perpetuate a godly seed from generation to generation to generation so what he's saying is in the clothes that you wear here's what i want you to do make sure that you honor the difference that I instituted at creation. Who instituted male and female? God did. This isn't just Isaac Farnsworth thinks that women should not wear pants. It's easy to dismiss if you frame it in that context, but that's not the context. The context is that the God of heaven and earth who made all things made males and females. And he says to his people, I want you to honor the difference that I instituted. And chiefly, this is what happens in the clothing. Because when the clothing slips, what follows? Everything else. Clothing is this. I think this is why beards have made such a comeback in our modern world. You know, in the United States 20 years ago, there weren't a lot of beards. But today, if you want to make sure people know you're a man, you better grow a beard. (laughs) It's all we've got left. The women have our haircuts. They have our clothes. What do we got? We got nothing. Put a beard or a mustache or something on. Let Let people know I'm a man. Right? Any other way to try to let them know beyond that's embarrassing. It's shameful. It's shameful. It ought not be so. But the Lord, in his creation, guess what he did? He outsmarted all the liberals. Amen. Amen. He outsmarted all the liberals. Because you can't take it out of the design. Amen. Right. There's a difference. Amen. And so God says, when you dress your body, honor me. Amen. Honor the difference that I made. Right. And so that's what he's telling him. So this is why we say from a clothing standpoint, you say, well, why is clothing such a big deal? And it's like, I don't actually know. It's kind of bizarre, but it's a big deal. But it is the very first thing that God did when he came to deal with man's sin. Amen. He clothed them. Yeah. So it was a big deal and it's still a big deal. And I think, you know, if we didn't have as a church, if we didn't have the standard that we preach from the pulpit on women, uh, wearing skirts and dresses and they shouldn't shouldn't be wearing pants even though it's been it's become the norm the question isn't what's norm in our society the question is what honors the Lord Amen. so we need to get away from the idea of we've been kind of socialized into this norm um, because it's only been the norm for the past number of decades it's not uh, historically been the norm uh, but there's a lot of things going on that are now the norm that you would admit are not good Amen. right we're not going to be scheduling any Uh, drag queen story times at Victory Baptist Church anytime soon and we're also not going to um, encourage or or anything else our women to be dressing like men and if any men dress like women that's not acceptable either Uh, because we want to honor the distinction that God made when he says no these two these are two different creations created for different purposes that independently and uniquely reflect my glory. Amen. And they ought not be mingled or mixed in ways that, that deny or neglect the distinction that I made when I created them. In the original creation, you could have viewed Adam and Eve from any distance and from any angle and said, yep, that's the woman. Yep, that's the man. And it should be the same today. I shouldn't have to you know, examine too closely to figure out what you are. It ought to be as evident as it would have been in the Garden of Eden from any distance, from any angle. But, oh, yeah, this is a woman. It's amazing. We went to West Point and, um, of course, had my family in tow, which was a real privilege 
to get to have them there. But, you know, they were in the lobby. And it's interesting the number of people that we encountered, several people uh, that we encounter who just remark about our daughters. But it's because they look like women. And you are at West Point. So the number of women that look like that is pretty low. Uh, there's a lot of females there. Um, but not many women who look like women. And so it, it drew people's attention. And we had some people come over and even remark and say, you know, that they really appreciated that, respected that. Man, they're so beautiful. And, yeah, they, God created women to be beautiful, right? I mean, they don't, you don't have to be provocative to be beautiful. So you can, uh, you can be beautiful in a godly way. So same thing you get into the New Testament, and we have Paul saying in 1 Corinthians 11, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame to him? I, I, I kind of marvel at this. I, as the pastor of the church, I have um, there's a lot of perks of being pastor, but checking the mail is not one of them. Um, but it's interesting to get the mail, and I get all these, you know, summer jam, youth festival things, and they want us to you know, load up all of our youth and go to this Christian uh, summer jam, something or other. But the, the entire advertisement, on the front and on the back, I look at them all. I look at them, I read, I read all the fine print, I read everything. The name of Christ isn't on them, not once, which I always find interesting. But the pictures of the people in these bands nowadays, is just, I don't think these people have ever read their Bibles. But they're Christian. So all is well, right? But Paul says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. It tells me that any God-fearing man who reads that would say, I better not let my hair grow long. Then you have people say, well, what's what's long, brother? I mean, is it touching your collar long? Is it uh, halfway down my back long? Because some people have longer hair than that, so that's short by comparison, right? Well, if God said long hair is a shame, I'd keep it short. It's not how long can I have it. It's it needs to be short. Amen. Well, by whose definition? Play it safe. Yeah. Amen. If you fear God, play it safe. And just keep it short. Amen. Right? It's a matter of whether you fear God or not. It's the same with the, the dress in Deuteronomy 22. He says everyone who mixes all the dr- clothing and dress and doesn't make a clear distinction that they're an abomination to him because they're failing to honor his design failing to acknowledge the distinction that he made no you're not a man you're a woman no you're not a woman you're a man as weird as that is to have to say (laughs) nonetheless the reprobate mind uh, knows no bounds when it comes to depravity so we have it about dress we have it about hair we have um clearly about sexual orientation Leviticus 20 if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman both of them have committed and what abomination it's the same word as those who mingle the the dress code he says when you actually do the act it's an abomination but when you dress and mix all that together Even though it's not doing the act, it's an abomination. In the eyes of God, he sees it as an abominable thing. He says, but if they do that, they've committed an abomination, and they shall surely be put to death, and their blood shall be upon them. So I was talking to somebody recently, and they said, well, I don't think God should place limits on who we can love. I said, well said, well, God didn't place any limits on who you can love. He commanded you to love everyone. He he placed absolute limits on sexual intercourse. And not only prohibiting it between, you know, men and other men and women and other women and all kinds of other, you know, lasciviousness that goes on, um, but he prohibited it to one marriage. It gets only in marriage. That's the sanctioned, ordained, God-given place for that to occur. So he prohibited everything else, right? And so it's not a prohibition on who you can love. Love everybody. But you're not talking about the same thing. Who you can have intercourse with is not the same thing as who you can love. The world tries to mingle those terms and make them the same thing. 
be sure you catch that. It's not the same thing. There is, there is no limit by God as who you can love, um, but you are absolutely prohibited from engaging behavior that he has deemed out of bounds, Amen. off limits. And as the creator, that's his prerogative. Uh, so we have hair, we have clothing, we have sexual purity, right? So we should have purity in our clothing, purity in our hair, purity in our sexual behavior. Uh, and because we know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God, then on, in a society that is broken and damaged and uh, full of darkness and sin and wickedness, then we can shine as a light just by doing those simple things, right? I promise you, if you dress your daughters in dresses and skirts in this world, in this culture, it shines a light. We, we experienced it everywhere we went. Just, of course, we were in the Northeast, a little darker, but everywhere we went, we experienced the reality of what people see, right? Some people appreciate that. Some people despise that, but people notice it. That's a light, right? It's shining some light on things. Know that God did create a difference, and, and there are people that still honor God by honoring the difference. So dressing our bodies is important to God, honoring the distinction that he made. I'll never back down from that standard. I've talked to other pastors, and I've said, man, help me here, because in the world in which we live, I mean, this world is, it, the house is on fire. It's burning to the ground all around us. And I've asked him, I said, you know, do you preach that women still ought to wear skirts and dresses and that men should wear pants? Nobody uses that phrase, who wears the pants in the family anymore, because this generation wouldn't even know what it means that much. Uh, my generation knew, uh, but you still have the restroom placards and people know, but we've become very depraved in our thinking, um, and so it's losing its, its hold. But I ask him, I say, you know, with everything that's going on, this seems like a minor issue. Is, you know, at what point do you just decide that that's not a it's not a doctrine that is you're going to stand on given the gravity of everything else that's going on and it's interesting other pastors they wrestle with the same thing because i mean this world we're in it is just a mess um but god's people are still called to holiness Amen. still called to righteousness so i don't rail against the world like i said this morning i'm not concerned that the world is evil some people feel some people are spending more time trying to stop the world from being evil. I'm not interested in that. The world is evil. Amen. I'm concerned that people profess faith in Christ who continue in their wickedness. Right. That's concerning. Amen. And so it's not about trying to solve the whole world. The Lord has already said he's going to judge them that are without. He's going to take care of it. But he says we're supposed to judge what's within. We're supposed to deal with the things of Christ that we've been given charge of. And I'm sure, you know, it's amazing to me how many first time visitors we have. Because women lead their homes. We had a lot of first time visitors who come one time and they see all the women in the congregation wearing dresses and skirts. And they're gone. And if we would drop that one standard, I don't have any doubt that we'd be running 200 people which is why I'll never drop that standard. Amen. Because that standard says something about the heart. Right. Am I willing to listen to truth, or do I want to be the author of what's right? And, and people that will dismiss themselves before they ever hear the conversation, right? No, don't ever study it. They just want to stay there. That's a, that's a difficult place to be. Um, but our job isn't, uh, especially my job as a pastor, isn't to just welcome everyone into the assembly that wants to be a part of it. That's right. I know that comes a bit of a surprise, um, but I'm supposed to take care of the flock. And so I, I try to take that responsibility very seriously. And that is a, uh, it is a doctrine that is in the word of God, and I, I, I can't see my way to clear to remove it. So um, there it is, roles in society, dress, hair, how we adorn ourselves, honoring those things in relationship to what God instituted so there are roles for male and female in the church, roles in the home, and roles in society, all of them instituted by the God who made us. And each of those could stand more teaching and preaching, certainly, on their own. They each stand on their own, and you could have any number of lessons uh, to teach them and engage in those things. 
but just as an overview for the purposes of what we're trying to establish today, that's, uh, that's fairly comprehensive. So male and female helps us know how to interact with one another. It provides a rule uh, of conduct for our Christian homes. Remember, our rule of conduct isn't what society says. Amen. It's not the norm. Abortion's a norm. You want to sign on with that? You know, it's, there's a lot of things that are a norm that don't, don't hold weight for the Christian. That's not our ethic. Amen. So we live to a higher standard than that. Our standard of rule and conduct is given by Christ. What does Christ desire from me in my life? What would be honoring and glorifying to the Lord Jesus Christ and those kind of things? Uh, and all of that flows from a right understanding of the gospel and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. As we've said, if you understand the gospel correctly, um, and I, I do say correctly, I don't think that's an overstatement. If you understand it correctly as um, being brought to a knowledge of the truth of who Jesus Christ is and the authority with which he speaks, you know, it's that faith that pro provokes us in our life to continue pursuing holiness and to continue pursuing to work out our salvation right the things that that we have known and believed right it's comforting to know at least for me it's a tremendous comfort to know not to beat this with a drum but just as you think about the idea of family and husband and wife and trying to find our place in this world and how do we build up one another in that most holy faith it's encouraging to know that the faith we have in that gospel is the power of God, right? We didn't produce it. It's not ours on our, you know, it's, it's a, it's a product of the new creation of Jesus Christ, that workmanship of his that we are. So that's helpful because we're all going to struggle with failure. We're all going to struggle with uh, discouragement. We're going to have a struggle with defeat. I was talking earlier with Curtis and we were just sharing some thoughts and especially coming out of the men's event this weekend. And, you know, failure is when you quit. Defeat is not failure. How many of you have been defeated? I've suffered some enormous defeats in my life. I've I have been had my clock cleaned. I've been put on my heels. I've been knocked to the mat. Uh, I've had knockdown drag out fights with myself uh, and in all of these things to attempt um, to overcome as Christ calls us to do uh, and guess what it's a fight but it but that's how God intends it to be and it, and it causes us to lean on him but that faith working in Christ continues to strengthen us for the journey so I would encourage you don't worry about defeat defeats are an opportunity to learn it's an opportunity to get better. Why do we are, why do the sports teams watch tape? So they can see, uh, see what we did wrong there. We didn't execute as crisply. We weren't expecting that from the other team. Next time, we need to be in a little better position. Here's some things we can change. Defeat is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to, to drop back, you know, reflect. That's what I tried to do this morning. Just create some space to reflect for yourself about your own life, your relationship with Christ as your Savior, as your shepherd, as your Lord. Reflect on your relationship to him as a follower of his and whether or not you're being effective at following and is he really leading you. Uh, but all those things provide opportunity to learn and to grow and reflect. So failure uh, is not what happens when we're defeated. It's what happens when we quit. So I would just encourage you as your pastor, I've been defeated. You've all suffered defeats. Uh, that's okay. Our God is able Right. He can he can clean it up. He can he can pick us up like the Bible tells us we will not utterly fall because he's able to hold us up. He's got us by the hand uh, and he will dust us off and set us on our feet right again. And OK, let's learn from that <laughs> uh, favorite line in life lesson. Don't do that again. Right. <laughs> Tell myself that a lot. Don't do that again. Uh, that doesn't work, right? So we learn, and that's okay. This, uh, this is a learning enterprise, amen? I want this church to be uh, a church where um, we're free to learn. But to learn, you're going to have to make mistakes, which means we're going to have to have grace for one another because we're not going to get it right all the time. But we want to have, have an environment where we're learning, right? Chris does. Amen. Amen. We want to have an environment where we're learning, where we're growing, where we're developing, where we're challenging ourselves and we're moving ahead. Not interested in wandering. 
I don't want to wander. I want to follow. I want to move, right? I want to grow. So hopefully that's a help to you. We'll pick up from there next week. Male and female, it matters. But it's not just the world's problem. The world has that issue and that problem, but it's just as prevalent in our churches, right? But it may manifest itself differently, but it's the same spirit. It's the same spirit at work, the same spirit of disobedience at work. So you say, well, that's really harsh, preacher. It's not my desire to be harsh. It's my desire to say what I feel like I must to provoke you to at least, you know, even if it's a bit of a jolt, okay, receive it, think about it. Um, it's my desire for you to receive it and to, to reflect on it and to say, okay, have I just been being obstinate in some area of my life and is it time to yield myself to Christ and to move ahead uh, and to get out of this wilderness, stop wandering around, amen? So with that, Brother Steve, you'll come. We'll have a...